Hi, my name is Tim Sheehan. Tim Sheehan from Gulf of Maine in, in Pembroke. And uh, uh, thanks for having me down here. I've never presented at anything like this, and I'm literally terrified uh, and <laughs> nightmares all week. Uh, I had a little talk with Bridie and Chad uh, midweek, and literally everything I was thinking of talking about um, really didn't sound that good after speaking with them. But, uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, we have a little business down east, and I'd like to tell our story of, of what we've been doing with the clam industry. Uh, we've got a lot, a lot of young people involved. We sort of reinvigorated things. Uh, before I start, uh, the DMR has been great in helping us. Uh, if you know, Washington County has got a no man's land. Uh, enforcement has brought on more, uh, more Marine Patrol. It's been a great help to clean it up. The, the dirty diggers, if you want to call them that. Uh, water quality has been awesome in opening our beaches. Uh, sort of minimizing the red tide effects and, and flood effects and we're very thankful for that um, uh, it's just been it's been great to have the DMR's help as we try to uh, bring this this uh, local shellfish economy back around so uh, anyway uh, so I'm I'm just a, a business guy I used to be a teacher I um, run my business since 2002 and uh, by luck and fate or whatnot, uh, our science business went south and we, we said, well, what the heck else can we do? And we looked around and said, well, how about we, we start uh, buying some clams and periwinkles? And I will probably rush a little bit through this, but uh, hopefully there will be some stuff here to be gleaned. And I don't mean to insult anyone. Uh, if you're a digger, please don't take offense at me. Please, I feel like I'm throwing myself to the lions. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit here, but these are just my opinions, what I see, and how I think we could do better with this economy and create more uh, local uh, opportunities. So, um, a little bit on the background, how we ended up in it. I'd like to highlight uh, the, all of our harvesters, explain the small, what I call small town politics that we're facing, and then give some suggestions for the industry. Uh, there's kind of a lot here, but like I said, we started in 2002, uh, had a guy that's in a captain's license, started doing tours around Cogscook while I was teaching high school science, and that led me to the marine world. The marine world provided me with a bounty of sea life to sell to labs and universities, and uh, in 2008, the shit hit the fan and uh, our business went south, everyone was laid off, and we said, well, let's get into, into shellfish. So we have quite a group of harvesters. They don't, uh, it's not like 300 of them come in every day, but in rotation, we have uh, uh, probably 100 uh, local guys uh, from Eastport, Tresca, Lubeck, Dunbrook, Berry, Dannysville, Pleasant Point. And then we also have a contingency of Native American harvesters um, from Subaya. So this is our location, Cobscook Bay, if you've never been down there, beautiful spot, amazing huge tides. <laughs> incredible biodiversity uh, and shellfish as you know with our scallop industry do very well um, this is our facility we're right on route one we've got a nice professional safe uh, uh, facility there with all the all the bells and whistles a guy could ever want uh, to uh, uh, support the local harvesters and uh, move shellfish to the market uh, lower uh, I guess it would be lower right uh, two of my kids sorting starfish, which we sell as marine life specimens. Uh, when we first started uh, locally, we asked around, people said, well, there's no dig, there's no one wants to dig clams anymore, and there's no freaking clams either. So we were like, ah, oh, geez, that's, that's right, there's, there's no clams. But um, we found over time, by breaking down barriers, that we were able to um, put people back to work. And yes, people did want to dig clams, and they didn't mind the work, and it was part of their history, and they were excited to get back out and do what uncle used to do, and then Grampy and, and entire family. So uh, uh, having been a teacher, I looked at this as how do we break down and, and open doors for people as opposed to locking them off the beaches. And if you look in the middle there, if you know nothing about planning, what's a state license? What's a town license? How do I know if an area is open or closed? What's this, you know, there were a lot of things like that 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 had to be solved. So if you scan down through here, we've done a bunch of little innovations, very tiny, simple things, such as printing tide charts and giving them to every digger that walked through the door. Uh, we sent out a, a text message to all our diggers every tide. Low tides at two, it's noontime. You might want to go head down to the beach. 
right? Here's the price today. Here's what's open. Here's what's closed. And the girlfriends love that. They're like, I got the text. Get the beach, you know, and, and that helped us uh, increase our, our landings. Uh, Facebook stuff, celebrating the industry, clam digger hats, clam digger stickers, whatever, you know, uh, we could put together to, to build some. A lot of people tend to think, oh, I'm a clam digger uh, and, and I'm, I'm a nobody, but it's a it's an awesome profession. You work for yourself, you set your own schedule, you get paid in cash the day you work. Uh, damn it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome job. You see seals, eagles, you know, tide pool stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty decent. So, uh, and when I ran my tour company, a cute little couple from Manhattan and their two kids would pay me 500 bucks for two hours of walking around the beach and digging some clams and, and taking a little ride in the boat. And so, uh, I think there's a lot to be said to celebrating what we do and, and what this, this local economy um, does. And, and I, I'm pleased and proud of, of what we've been able to do. Uh, here's a few little images. Uh, DMR has apps on, uh, or their license applications online, but if you don't have a computer or you can't get to the library, how do you get uh, a photocopied application? We print them, we hand them out by the dozens and dozens. We print clam tags for our diggers. Your name's on there, your license number's on there, and circle the code. When you're done digging clams, do you really want to sit there with wet, muddy hands and try and write on a piece of tieback that won't even accept a, a pen? So these are, are, are you know, just a, a tiny little solution, but geez, it helps the digger not get the fine. If the digger gets the fine, then he can't, or she can't come back and, and, and go to work. Uh, tide charts, main harbors, thank you very much. We print them off, highlight the big tides, put some contact info. Warden info, how the hell do I get a hold of the warden to find out if this is open or not, or if my license went through, or, or any of this stuff? We hand out these little slips of paper, I say, put them in your wallet, make sure you have these, Call your warden. We have great wardens where we are. Brian Brody, Russell Wright, all of these guys, um, they work like, like we are as teachers and they try to educate people and education is very important. Just having a place to go to the bathroom and a drink of cold water. Maps, we have an entire map from Lubeck all the way around our bay. So when we're talking a particular flat, we don't go, well you know down there where Jimmy had, you know, got the Toyota stuck in his, it, we're able to go and walk over and point on the map and say, that's where, you know, we saw this, or this is where there's a lot of seed, or that sort of thing. Uh, info from the DMR website, we print off the red tide and the flood closure maps. I got into building my own clam gear because sometimes a digger wouldn't show up and I'd find out that she broke her digger or it got stolen or whatnot. Having gear there available um, keeps the people doing what they want to do, which is earning money. And the big one is technology. We partnered with the cell, uh, uh, oh, scrap industry software maker that allows us to get the data from every digger, where they harvested, how long they harvested, what cove. And so if, if uh, Julie King comes in and she wants to know, you know where her clams came from, how much she earned this month, how many bushels, we have that. And that allows us to to sort of map who our top performers are. It's all touch screen, so there's, you know, it's just like in, in, the, in the store, and it was, it was quite a mission. I'd like to see all dealers have this, so that we could all have instant info to run back to, like Chad said, what's working and what's not working. I mean, who wants a bunch of clam busy work, picking up trash, moving seed? I mean, the idea is more clams and more money for, for our towns and for our areas. So, uh, and once again, the cell phone app was invaluable. You don't have to text everyone. You put them all in one big mass thing and send one, one text out. Um, and you know, we did very well. Our, our, our business uh, doubled and tripled, and we, got, uh, we went from a, a dozen harvesters to 20 to 50 to literally hundreds. And we sort of uh, created a problem um, for ourselves, but the timing was right. Prices were high, the DMR worked hard to, to open flats, um, and then the media likes to pick up, and I'm a media whore, and whenever something happens, I, I give them a call and say, hey, come on down, check this out. Um, and and it, was, it was like a, 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 you know, an old-time revival. People came out of the woodwork, saw friends. We had a, a, an 89-year-old digger. We had, you know, three-year-old diggers. It was, it was like a, a big field day on the flats down in our part of the Cobscope Bay. Um, so, uh, it's once again just proving the fact that clam digging is too hard and no one wants to do it.
Uh, here's a look at some of our harvesters. Um, and we do have a lot of children, and I'm very excited about that. The children come in with their parents. We have little kitty baskets and little kitty diggers, and we make them uh, feel at home. We give them candy. We have a little touch tank there, and people feel welcome. Women feel welcome there. It isn't just the good old boys club. Um, there's a bathroom if they have been on the flats and can't whiz in the woods like, like the boys do. Uh, and we just uh, we have fun. We have green beer on St. Patrick's Day, and uh, we have uh, ice cream popsicles on the, on the hot days and maybe even a can of beer from now. Um, so, unfortunately, I, in my own little world, I'm like Mort from work, and you know, I just arrive and say, hey, I'm going to buy clams, and I apologize for not taking into consideration everyone's thoughts and feelings, but um, we uh, have a lot of angst. Uh, people have shot at our sign, we've had a boat burned, I I'm, I'm a little bit uh, scared and worried and, and thinking of leaving this industry, but um, rightfully so, the, the old time diggers, the good old boys have always been digging, don't like a whole bunch of people coming down and digging their claims. But we all own the claims. Um, immediately, groups started getting together and saying, we got to do something about this. Too many diggers, the sky is falling. But like Chad says, um, is it really that it's too many diggers? Um, he claims not. Um, the local claim committees raised fees. Uh, Double license fees. Native Americans were barred from getting Harry resident um, licenses. I even took this to Paul LePage and his attorney, and he and they uh, said yes, indeed, they cannot qualify as residents of Perry. Therefore, they are non-residents. So they are faced with what used to be a $200 license fee being almost $400, and so that uh, ended up. Uh, removing over, I would say, 90%. You know, these are just shooting from the hip. Uh, this year, when we raised license fees in Pembroke compared, 90% of our Indian diggers did not come in anymore. Uh, and our students, their license doubled as well, and a lot of them didn't come in. Now, that sort of also has a lot to do with the clam price. So had the price been $3, I'm sure more people would have ponied, ponied up. Uh, we did get, finally, Pembroke and Perry on the ordinance. We actually got real appointed shellfish members. Uh, I've been going to clam meetings since uh, 2012. Uh, and uh, we never officially had those diggers, I mean, you know, those, those uh, appointees on a committee, so that's a good thing. Uh, we have a very good town ward now who's working around Cogscook Bay. Uh, this is something I, I it, once again, is my opinion, and I see some people here from Eastport, but uh, Eastport formed an ordinance um, and went with, I believe, 10 to 1 uh, resident versus non resident. And since uh, Eastport hasn't sold 10 licenses yet, uh, there's no uh, non resident slots available. So a lot of our Native American diggers used to dig in Eastport because it was town open, um, and they can no longer do that. So. Um, I guess my point with that uh, and the, the corner I've sort of painted myself into is in building the industry and getting everyone going back to work, uh, I didn't really take into consideration what everyone would be feeling of, about that. But um, the resource levels, according, according to DMR um, and according to you know, our local warden like Russell Wright, uh, the resource is still there, uh, and that according to our computer system, in 2014, the average clams per digger, say, was 47 pounds. In 2015, it went to 50, say, 51 pounds per digger per day. And, and uh, in 2016, it, it went to almost 60 pounds. So, I mean, I could be fudging the data, uh, and why wouldn't I? I'm giving a presentation, but that's, that's what we saw. I don't mind if, if I don't want us to dig out all the clams. It would be counterintuitive. No clams, no job for me, no income. But uh, what what we've done or what's happened and the angst we've created is um, made people uh, uh, organized against um, so many diggers digging in our area, and so that's affecting our business and our revenues have steeply declined. We want it to be sustainable. Um, 
like I told you, I'm, I'm really frustrated. We're ready to, to get out of this. Uh, I find it hard to stomach that Native Americans, having dug clams for thousands of years in our area, only have access to very few acres around their little pleasant point. I just I cannot believe that. Um, the ordinances as I see them, I do not agree with town ordinances. I'd like to see a regional ordinance with diggers, with scientists, those sort of people. Um, everyone, we go to these meetings and everyone's like, everything sucks, it's never going to work. We tried that in, you know, in 73, we tried it in 81, you know, gloom, doom, gloom, doom, gloom, doom. And, and you know, this is a multi-million dollar industry. It could put kids to work. We, uh, in, the, in the five years we've been buying clams, I think probably five or seven million dollars of revenue has come into Gulf of Maine and gone out to diggers and, be, and been used at local stores and for cars and all of this stuff. And now we're faced with diggers can't dig anymore because we got to keep those guys out. And let's, you know, the feeling I get is let's get rid of Tim Sheehan and Gulf of Maine too. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a sad sack. Um, and, but I realize what I've done here. So our Gulf of Maine revenues are down. Um, I don't expect this next year to be any better. Um, and I don't know why the state of Maine doesn't go, oh my gosh, multi-million dollar industry, and we are, other than supporting DMR, doing nothing to it to what are we doing? You got people helping the dairy farmers, you got people the state helping the loggers, the, all these different industries. Where, you know, when I grew up milking cows in high school, there was a milk board that said, this is what the milk price would be. And there are farmers and, and you know, politicians, and they, and they figured it out so farmers could stay in business. Who the hell is making sure that clamors can stay in business in the state of Maine? Nobody. You know, I'm not taking away from DMR, but we, you got to put money in. I mean, if seven million came into Pembroke, Perry, Eastport, and, and people made some money and felt good about themselves, What's wrong with that? And why do, you know, why are we in this situation? We should be, we should be, uh, you know, going great guns and trying anything. Like the stuff Brian Beal is, is doing down here. Has it been tried right in Cobbsville? Some has, but let's try some of those things then. Um, here's my what if. I try to back things out. What if we put 100 guys to work and they each got a bushel a day for 300 days, they took the other 65 days off. Okay, do the math there. If they got two dollars a pound, I you know figure on the lower end maybe or an average. It's three. Uh, what was it? Three million dollars payroll. If we could just figure out a way to pimp out our flats, and it may not be seeding, and it may not be brushing. I don't know what the heck it is, but that's a lot of money. A three million dollar payroll. A hundred guys, gals, kids, and maybe some people only dig. 50 bushels a year because they're a part time and maybe the highliners, the old tried and true diggers, they get 300 plus diggers. But geez, $30,000 a year part time job, I'll sign up for it. I'll go deer hunting in my, in my spare time. But uh, it seems like you, we ought to be able to back that out and then say, okay, how do we get, what was it, seven and a half bushels per acre. What's an acre? 200 by 200. What is our production per clam flat in Maine? What is the average production? Does anyone know? Like, we have 4,000 acres in Pembroke, Perry, uh, Eastport, and Robinson. 4,000. So, uh, and what if we could get it to 20 bushels per acre? Or 100 bushels per acre? Because we did so well. We're not talking about 3 million anymore. We're talking about 6 or 8 or 10 or 12 or, or 15 million. Not 100 guys and gals. But it, it seems possible, and you know, when I spoke with Chad and Bridie, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is bad, they're going to tar and feather me, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, blueberry farmers do it. They don't just wait for Mother Nature to give them a good crop, Wyman's and cherry food, foods and those stuff. They do stuff. Does it always work? Probably not. You know, but I think we can do that. Uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, these are the little guys that come in. They were so thrilled to get a bundle of cash. And they came back. Some of them came back religiously for a week or two. The first little girl there, her father is one of my best diggers. And he's not digging anymore. I don't know why. But he did come to me to see if we could help him get his non-resident license of $400. Uh, we, we just can't do it. Our little micro-loan program was to help people with a $50 digger or a $100 license. It's just... It's, it's, 
it is not possible. So he's not digging anymore. And that little girl, who made hundreds and hundreds of dollars, my four kids included, thousands of dollars, cars paid for, college paid for, trips, everything. The, the, you know, the resource, I think, is still there. Let's prove that it's there. Let's figure out how many diggers can, should have access to it. And let's, um, let's grow the industry and be happy about it and, and celebrate it and, 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 you know, yes, I'm going to make money. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to make money. I started selling earthworms when I was 10, a fisherman. The only little hippie kid in Patton, Maine, made $1,000 in, in a summer selling earthworms. That's my story, and I hope I haven't pissed anyone off too bad. <laughs>